Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. There's something about Freddie Mercury which spoke to us. There's no part of the stadium, uh, no matter how huge it is, doesn't feel involved. Right, I'm here for two hours, you're going to watch me. Everything I say or do, you're going to sort of listen. This guy is utterly charismatic, you know. In a, in, in a way you shouldn't be at all, but charisma's not what you look like, it's just what you are like. What are you going to do with a name like Mercury? Be a superstar. Freddie Mercury was, and remains, one of the best-loved rock stars of all time. A consummate showman and entertainer, critically and commercially lauded singer and songwriter, both as lead singer with Queen and as a solo artist, he enjoyed a colourful rock star lifestyle and gave an astonishing contribution to music during his career. His popularity and high profile meant that his untimely death from AIDS in 1991 was instrumental in raising the profile of the disease, in addition to leaving behind a body of work that will be forever regarded as one of the greatest in popular music. Freddie Mercury was born Farooq Bulsara on September 5, 1946, to Indian Parsi parents Bomi and Jair. Born in Zanzibar, a tropical island off the east coast of Africa, it was an unusual beginning for a boy who would grow up to be one of the world's biggest rock stars. He was born in Zanzibar in 1946. His father, as far as I can recall, was a middle-ranking clerk in government circles who earned a decent living, and that's why they'd moved from India to Zanzibar, because he had a job there. His parents uh, sent him to, back, to, back to the grandparents' house in India, and he goes to school there. And, he's, and he's, so he's kind of like cut off from his parents as well. And I don't know if this affected him anywhere at all, but he seemed like quite a hardy kind of like young guy. And at school, he's actually quite good at sport as well, which is kind of something you don't expect later on. He's, he's kind of really into his boxing and things, which is not sort of an image you'd have of Freddie Mercury, is it? But they quickly noticed he had a very, like, a great artistic kind of talent, and he's very, very good at the piano, and he learned piano at school. And that's where I believe Farouk became Freddie. Not Freddie Mercury, but Freddie Balsara. And that became who he was. Before he left, he'd actually started his first band called The Hectics. Leaving school and the moderate success of schoolboy band The Hectics behind in India, Freddie had been back in Zanzibar less than a year when a violent political revolution broke out across the island in January 1964. Fearing for the family's safety, the Bulsaras decided to take Freddie and his younger sister Kashmira and emigrated to England. Because of the uprising in Zanzibar, they fled to London and he started to attend um, Polytechnic over here um, and became totally immersed in the emerging sort of artistic sort of scene. Going into London in 64, it's a fantastic time to be there, you know, you're right and just before Swing in London, you know, a couple of years before that kicks off, it's got to affect you, you know. You know, and then he goes to art school because he's got this artistic kind of thing going on. He went through college and it was at that point he got involved in music in a way. Jimi Hendrix has started to really make an impact in the UK and Hendrix became a big, big influence on him. When Hendrix sang, the way he looked, it's everything just just the whole thing was all as one, you know, and it's like, he's a massive influence of, influence of Freddie Mercury, the flamboyant kind of stage nature, the, the, just, just the exoticness of him, the, just, the, um, just the, the pure genius of Jimi Hendrix, you know, he actually saw, you know, Freddie actually saw him play, which is like, I think, I think anybody who's seen Jimi Hendrix play in those early days would have been, had their minds completely blown. So he goes to Ealing Art College and he meets this guy, Tim Staffel, who tells him he's in this band, this band called Smile, and Smile just happens to be the band that, uh, Roger Taylor and Brian May are in it. So it's, there's a connection that will be made here already. I mean, so Freddie starts hanging around them. He's fascinated by them. You know, here's a, here's a guy, Brian May, who, who could play guitar already, almost as good as Jimi Hendrix. He's an amazing guitar player. 
So you could tell that Freddie wanted in, you know, but he couldn't get in because his best mate was actually the singer and the bass player in the band, so you can't actually uh, shove him out of the way. Freddie knew there was sort of good things happening between sort of Roger and, and Brian, and um, Freddie wanted to be a part of this, this, you know, this band. And Brian has told me the very first time he met Freddie, from the very word go, he was always Freddie. He was always really in your face, always had lots of ideas. Um, the first time Brian met Freddie, in fact, was after uh, uh, Brian's previous group, Smile, one of their gigs. Um, Freddie came straight backstage with Roger Taylor, uh, mutual friends, straight into the dressing room, telling Brian where they were going wrong, what they needed to do, how they made, needed to make the whole show much more theatrical, darling, and why don't they all shut up and listen to him? Um, Brian said the problem was was that you know anybody else you just wouldn't take it from. But in Freddie's case, he actually did seem to know what he was talking about. And everybody did tend to listen. So he's become very, very mate, mate to these people, very, very close to them. He moves into, he's living in the flat in Kensington. He's right in the middle of the kind of swinging London art scene. And with Roger Taylor, he has a stall on and, um, and Kensington Market selling kind of art objects, uh, Victorian clothes, a very kind of flamboyant kind of style thing going on. Whilst Freddie had become good friends with the members of Smile, he was eager to perform in a band himself. But for now, that would have to be with someone else. His first band in the UK was a band called Ibex. They came from Liverpool and he became their front man. He's pretty short lived the band and he's obviously like, you know, he went for the audition and started singing. They're like, whoa, he's good, you know, we'll get him in the band. But he's, he's obviously like far ahead of them, you know. He's, um, he wants to change the band's name to Wreckage, which is actually a far better name, but they're not so sure. And what he did, because the rest of the band wouldn't go along with it, he had a band meeting and they said, no, we're happy with Ibex, we don't like Wreckage, go away, no way. So what he did one night was he called each individual member of the band and said, would you change the name as the rest of the band agreed? And each member said, well, if everybody else is with it, I'll go along with it. Ibex unfortunately fell apart and his next project was the uh, Sour Milk Sea. But he was in that band very briefly and they didn't really go anywhere. Again, there were personnel problems, changes going on, and it didn't really amount to anything. And then Tim Stafford decides to leave Smile and they're like, like a shot. Everything would have appealed to him the minute that Tim decided he wasn't going to carry on as the front man anymore. That's where the, the seeds were sown for, for what would become, you know, really one of the, one of the best rock bands that, that this country's ever produced. Having officially joined forces with Brian and Roger, Freddie decided an image change was in order, and soon Smile would change their name to Queen. Calling the band Queen all these years later sounds like a camp idea, but in fact at the time it was a fairly challenging thing. The whole idea of not being uh, bracketed any, into any particular sexuality, uh, it wasn't so much a gay name or a camp name, it was more to say don't categorize us this isn't one thing and it's not the other this is the era of experimentation this is the era when anything goes and i wonder even back then whether freddie mercury had the idea that this band were going to be different because they weren't going to be just rock just pop they could do everything and of course their career proved they could do everything and anything they did was readily accepted by a large legion of fans in fact there was some debate over whether brian may would continue with his career because uh, he had some serious final exams coming up at university. He had a very promising career as a scientist ahead of him. I think Roger was studying to be a dentist. They all took their education very seriously, and it was quite a while before they decided, OK, we're going to be Queen, we're going to be professional musicians, well into um, recording days. Um, but once they made that, that decision, from, from what I can tell, they were all convinced they were going to get there, and it was just a matter of time. Freddie was the catalyst to that group going from being kind of semi-pro, semi-serious, to being a full-on serious proposition. I think Queen, from the early days of being together, were convinced they were going to dominate the rock world. And they did, and that's what they set out to do, and that's what they knew they were going to do. For Freddie, it was everything. There was no alternative. There was no thought that perhaps he would have a serious career elsewhere in an office or tucked away in the back corner of a building somewhere. As far as he was concerned, it, he was always on stage anyway. It's, it's a really interesting kind of concert of people in this group. And they've got a few, few bass players, you know, it's about three or four bass players um, that John Deacon's brought into the group. Then they have the kind of the perfect lineup. It's really good strong life and he's really working the musicianship is already like really like 
way out there, you know. And also vocalists, amazing. I mean, not only is Freddie great vocalist, but um, the rest of the band can really sing as well. What's really interesting about the early aspects of Queen's career in relation to Freddie Mercury is how he has taken it upon himself to style the band. Now, I mean, if you look at what they wear over that initial period up until sort of 1975, you know, I mean, I guess these days you, you'd be sniggering behind your hand. Um, but you have to remember, put into context, um, you know, this is all part of what helped create who Queen became. And Freddie's artistic talent is, is, is brought to bear pretty early on when he designed a logo, which is based on the four star signs of the band. And Roger Taylor puts it on his drum as well. It's a, it's a really good logo as well. And it's regal as well, so it kind of fits in the name of the band being Queen. It shows basically how important Freddie Mercury was to Queen above and beyond um, writing a lot of their material <laughs> and singing their songs. It's easy to say that Freddie was the driving force. And of course, as the front man, he was. But... Um... Brian May was very much a, his own man and knew what he wanted. He was a very educated man. So he knew exactly what he was going into. He wasn't just somebody's guitarist. He has, he's an, because of the extrovert's kind of stage persona, he always made them far more interesting than a lot of the other bands at that time doing some of the kind of stuff. So when you listen to the first kind of two Queen albums, they are like a lot of like complex time structures and fiddly little songs about fairies and elves and stuff like that. Which, which, you know, lyrically is, isn't that, that interesting. But there's something about them. They have, like, like a, a charm about them. Brian May, as I said, he, he wanted to be Led Zeppelin initially, but Led Zeppelin beat him to it. So there was a lot of these fairies and, and kings and dragons and all oh, this sort of progressive rock. A lot of overdubbing on the vocals, long songs. And I think for Queen 1 and 2, that's a sort of the theme. heavy rock group that always aspired to a great deal more. They could easily have become a very progressive rock group. Their early albums had a lot of very le lengthy, epic numbers. Everybody was trying to write their own Stairway to Heaven in those days. But Freddie, Freddie's influence was such that his, his attention span was short in terms of what you could achieve on stage. He didn't play an instrument over much on stage. He was a great piano player, but his main thing was to give a performance as a front man. And the thought of having to stand aside for 10 minutes while the rest of them jammed just wasn't really part of his scheme of things. The bedrock of their sound is, 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 and, is and always has been guitar-based heavy rock music. Um, but what made them so special was that they just were never afraid to experiment. They were never afraid to try anything um, I mean, that first album is, is, a, is a young band trying to be as epic as they can on almost every track. Um, it hurts sometimes. It's so painful that they want to be, you know, that, um, that epic. And it's something that they managed to temper and channel into sort of perhaps more direct songs on the second album. The first two Queen albums are very similar. Uh, and the reason for that was there was an enormous delay uh, over the release of the first album. In fact, they'd been signed by a production company uh, that worked out of Trident Studios in London, and it was the production company that did the deal with EMI. So although there was money involved, it was a very complicated deal which left them more or less penniless for most of the time. They were all sharing a house. Uh, they were riding the bus to work. Uh, they were kind of the poor relations there. People like Bowie were using Trident, Elton John, Rick Wakeman... Uh, and then Queen would go in and record during what they called downtime, small hours of the morning or very early in the morning, times when the major artists weren't there. Um, eventually the first album did come out, and the, uh, uh, but because of the delay, they'd already written a whole lot of other songs, already performing a lot of other things, but they felt they still weren't known, so 
the second album was kind of, it's the first album all over again, but it's just a little better, a little more accomplished. But they kind of got squashed together. During recording of the first Queen album at Trident, Freddie was asked to provide vocals for an experimental single on which Brian and Roger also played. The result, something of a departure from the regular sound of Queen, was released under the slightly dubious name of Larry Lurex. An engineer at the studio they were in, which was Trident Studios, wanted to mess around with the Phil Spector wall of sound, wanted to experiment a little bit. So he got Freddie Mercury in to do the vocals, and Freddie Mercury brought in Brian May and Roger Taylor. So he had, ended up with three quarters of Queen, or what was to be Queen. A lot of their success is more found on the road by touring and touring and touring than actually getting huge amounts of airplay. They weren't getting that much attention in the media. They were getting part of it, but they weren't regarded as a big band. And they spent a lot of time touring with groups like Mott the Hoople, Thin Lizzy, trying to get across to that hardcore rock audience. Yeah, they start getting a lot of um, critical acceptance in America. They start, they don't break it instantly, but they start getting a following in America and it starts going good for them over there. They did okay. Seven Seas of Rye was the breakthrough single and that came from the second album. Um, but if you listen to it, it's very much a punchy rock song. <laughs> you get to sheer heart attack um, they're still penniless but they've had some chart hits in the UK and it brought them a lot of confidence they also had a little more time to record the album they're now doing it in regular hours like any other major artist and Freddie is starting to bring in uh, songs that wouldn't have been considered for the first two albums when they were trying to establish their credentials as a serious rock band they're now bringing songs in like Killer Queen which um, was remarkable for the time. So when they get to Sheer Heart Attack, they, they kind of go more hard rock and the sound gets, it's, it's kind of more on the guitar, it's probably a tougher sounding record. They kind of ditch a lot of the um, more complex edges, although it's, it's still a fairly complex record. It's not all twiddly twiddly, it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a more direct kind of record, stripped down. Which, which happens with bands, you play a lot of live gigs, you, can't, you, you do hone your sound down to the crowd, you know, to the audience to get more to the exciting thing, thing of it. And Freddie came up with, with Killer Queen, which is like a really fantastic song, you know, it's an A song. And this, this is their first proper big hit. You couldn't imagine uh, any other so-called serious rock band coming in with something that sounded, at first hearing anyway, so light, so frothy, uh, so clearly not free doing all right now. And yet it was the key to what gave them their own unique sound later on. It had those incredible harmonies which kind of um, replicated the guitar sound. So you had the harmony vocals and the harmony guitars arching together to make this very unique, screechy, but weirdly attractive sound. You had Freddie uh, uh, talking about drinking Moe, Shondon and uh, uh, Mary Antoinette uh, and the sort of things that, you know, uh, wouldn't have necessarily have occurred to most other rockers at the time. She keeps them away in Shonda In a pretty cabinet Let them in case she said Just like Marie Antoinette A building a remedy A bruised job and a deal And it's like invitation you can decline Caviar and cigarettes Well-busted etiquette In retrospect, it's seen as a transitional album between Early Queen and what they became by Night of the Opera. At the time, though, uh, it seemed like a crowning achievement in its own right. I mean, it was a hugely popular album in the UK. And Killer Queen, I think, was certainly one of their first really big hits. 
Uh, the first time I think people that didn't just necessarily like loud guitar music thought, wow, I like that group. By the time you get to Sheer Heart Attack, things are, things are moving good for Queen. You know, they, they, they've got a hit, a hit single, the album's a hit album, kind of top ten. Not, not multi-million, but it's, it's big, it's a big album. And they, they're established now, they're ready, they're ready for something really big to come up. There were Seven Seas of Rye, which is their first hit, that got to number ten, and then Killer Queen was almost the number one, got to number two. Their first number one, I think, was only a year later. Uh, was it was Bohemian Rhapsody. Mama, she's killed a man, but I got a game, Susan, pulled my trigger, now he's dead. Mama, life had just begun. Rhapsody turned the pop world upside down like nothing else had ever done. I think it's fair to say it's a bold claim because there will be people saying what about the Beatles and Buddy Holly and the Stones etc. But honestly, in terms of what is regarded as a chart success and a classic song, Freddie Mercury in particular took the songbook, ripped it up, threw it away and then came up with a stream of consciousness that was Remarkable. You know, someone like Simon Carl or, or some tosser like that was asked what made a perfect pop record. He would not describe it as Bohemian Rhapsody, would he? A, a, a perfect pop record is verse, chorus, middle eight, out, isn't it? But this, is, this doesn't have a chorus. It doesn't even have verses. It's just all these little bits stuck together. In, it's got 60 chords in it. It's just the whole thing. Is, it's a work of genius. And Freddie wrote it on his own as well. It wasn't a thing he did with the rest of the band. And, and for ages, he didn't know what to do with it. He thought of scrapping it at one point. And, and he used to have it just lying around while they're making the album, just called Fred's Song. It's like, what should we do with this? They go, oh, I'm not so sure about it, you know. And then he'd come back to it, tinker with it, add another bit on. And then the rest of the band would go, well, this is pretty good, this. And they realised it was good. And when they worked it up, and, and, it's, and it took weeks to do, didn't it? Because they had to overdub all those vocals, one on top of the other. You know, Freddie legendarily was in the studio at the piano saying, you know, as the tape is wearing thinner and thinner, in these analog days before digital, they literally have to capture it all on a two inch tape. And it's wearing out because they've done so many overdubs. Just one more Galileo, boys. Just one more Galileo. We'd had so-called rock operas like Tommy and Sergeant Pepper, but no one had actually considered maybe taking rock music and taking opera and trying to put them together on a single. Of course, it was destined to be the most terrible failure or the hugest success. And I think these days, of course, we take it very much for granted that that was Queen's big moment. But I don't think we realise quite what a gamble they were taking. Uh, this is the, in the days before the internet, before satellite telly, we had three TV stations in the UK, of which only two carried music programmes regularly. We had one national pop station that had already told EMI they didn't like Bohemian Rhapsody because it was six minutes long. Um, it was only Kenny Everett, an ex-Radio 1 DJ who now had his own show on Capital Radio, a station in London, who was a huge fan of Queen, huge friend of Freddie's, uh, and just took the record and I think played it like, you know, three times in a row or something. It's the most, but before it was released, I mean, he just absolutely championed it. Um, the music press, which was a hugely influential part of the British music scene in those days, also got behind the record. They could easily have turned their noses up at it. Everything about Bohemian Rhapsody said flop, failure. Why on earth, it might demand to actually put it out as a single remains a mystery to this day. Yes, I know that it was pushed quite hard by Queen. That's what we wanted our first single. But you would have thought EMI would have said, no way. The fact that it went to number one for, you know, seven years or whatever it was, you know, a ridiculous amount of time. Um, and of course, was such a pioneering record in so many ways. The video that went with it, which now looks like one of the worst videos ever made, but at the time was quite astonishing. Queen overnight went from being a successful rock band to being a mega cultural icon. By the time you get to Night at the Opera, you've now got a group who have also by this stage severed their production, their deal with the production company at Trident. They've got brand new management, uh, John Reed, who also managed Elton John. They've got a new deal in America, which gave them all the encouragement and confidence they needed to uh, think about becoming 
this major league rock band. Night of the Opera is, is the album, and it's, it's a quintessential, it's the album that breaks Queen, huge, big style, you know, it's, it's one of the key albums of the 70s. If you want to understand what the 70s music was about, that is the album to go and listen to. A Night at the Opera was a huge worldwide hit and transformed Queen into one of the biggest bands in the world. The huge success of Bohemian Rhapsody and Night at the Opera absolutely opened the floodgates for Queen, not just in terms of millions of dollars, not just in terms of worldwide success, but because of the nature of the success, because of the huge spectrum of influences that were now being utilised in their music, and at this point, you start to see them really riding the crest of a wave. A Dare the Races, in, in a funny sort of way, was a continuation of Night of the Opera. It had the same elements, if you want, but just taken a slightly different direction. It was, in a way, more rockabilly, more rock and roll, and also more vaudeville than Night of the Opera. Night of the Opera still has as its base a lot of hard rock. And the hard rock element of Dare the Races wasn't siphoned out, it wasn't diluted, but it was added to. So therefore the hard rock element wasn't as crucial to that bass. Pretty much every album they made after Night at the Opera got bigger and bigger until in the 70s, until they reached a kind of peak in terms of worldwide fame, probably in about 77, 78. After A Day at the Races came the album News of the World in 1977 which received a lukewarm reception from critics at the time, but has since come to be viewed as one of the classic hard rock albums of the period. It also spawned what are arguably Queen's two biggest crowd pleasers, We Are The Champions and We Will Rock You. They were at that time in their careers where everything they touched turned to gold. Um, but of course, as is so often the case, at that very moment when everything appears to be going incredibly right, you know, lie the seeds of, of self-destruction. You can do anything, and by God, you're going to, darling. Um, I wouldn't want to criticise him, but... In retrospect, which we are fortunate enough to have, I guess you'd have to say uh, he indulged himself on every level to the max. That was what you did back then. But I think what happened was he began to feel indestructible. Musically, Queen now are uh, in a realm where they don't have competitors. Punk rock was supposed to be the in thing and old farts like Queen were supposed to be blown away. And yet here were Queen doing what they did and making it appeal above and beyond a rock audience. And there's the famous exchange where uh, Sid Vicious, uh, he bumped into Freddie Mercury. Sid Vicious says, oh, Freddie, so great to meet the man that brought opera into rock music. And Freddie says, ah, oh, Mr. Ferocious. A great pleasure, my dear. I, if you look at Elton John as being sort of almost a sort of um, a pastiche of what he really is, well, that's kind of what Freddie was naturally. I sometimes wonder if if he would have been able to get away with that today. If certainly, I mean, if if Queen were to be starting out today, they probably wouldn't even get a record deal. I mean, just because of the nature of the industry these days. In 1980, Queen released the game which would turn out to be one of their most successful albums, going four times platinum in the USA alone. By now they were huge in America. Uh, how about we become a disco group? Um, he was spending a great deal of time at places like Studio 54 and their equivalents around the world. Uh, by now he was very much out of the closet, as it were. The minute he grew that moustache, there was no getting away from the fact but again, it was really just tell us something we don't know. The whole glam rock thing paved the way for Freddie and the Queen because they were all camp. I mean, they weren't all uh, gay, you know, sweet and uh, anything but. But uh, they, 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 they certainly didn't 
uh, try to hide the fact whether you thought they were or not, you know, they, they, that didn't matter. So uh, Freddie, I think initially, uh, nobody questioned what he was, you know, whether he was gay or not. And it was to his credit that he used that to kind of say, hey, uh, so what? I'm gay and, you know, that's fine. And, and paved the way for many other artists, because I think in the wake of that, Elton came out and everything may have not have done. Although close friends always knew Freddie was a very quiet and private man, throughout Queen's heyday, he was nonetheless a very outgoing public figure, always inclined to enjoy the trappings of success. The whole kind of sex and drugs and rock and roll thing is now regarded as very sleazy. But back in the 70s, there was a much... Uh, Freddie would bring a much more artistic aesthetic to the whole thing. You know, um, the parties were always beautifully... Rooms would be beautifully decorated. There would always be fresh flowers and always the best champagne. And uh, they were very fond of having, uh, long before I'd ever seen this at other parties, you know, they were very fond of having, um, you know, I forget what you call them, but they'd have like naked models that would blend into the background because they'd been painted certain colours. So you'd be walking past a blue wall and suddenly a blue body would ask you if you'd like some champagne or... Um, I remember once they brought in what looked like a huge blancmange. I mean, it was about six foot tall and I carried, you know, by, you know, men in togas, you know. And, and actually what it was was a pile of naked bodies that eventually kind of unfolded like a flower, you know. Um, as the evenings would wear on, this would become less uh, polite, but... You know, uh, it was always done with a great sense of humour and a very arch kind of take on things. I think it's very important to remember that when you talk about Freddie Mercury's excesses in the 70s and perhaps 80s, um, to remember that he wasn't doing anything different to anybody else who would have been in his position would have done. This train of thought that because Freddie died from HIV and AIDS, that, you know, it was all down to the fact that he was a naughty boy in the 70s, you know, and it's like, well... You know, Freddie wasn't a drug addict. He wasn't an alcoholic. Um, he he appeared to enjoy lead lead an enjoyable and varied sex life. Nothing ever clouded the work that he did with Queen. Body language. Body language. Body language. widespread and enduring popularity of Freddie Mercury was based largely on his reputation for playing live, when he would always produce the most fantastically energetic theatrical performances. After Elvis, the most impersonated, um, you know, uh, for lookalikes are, are Freddie Mercury, and God, there are legions of them out there. Firstly, you've got to look right. So it's a constant problem to keep the weight off. <laughs> so, and obviously, with, with the costumes he had, you've got a head start. You know exactly what, you, what you've got to wear, so get the look right. Obviously, I don't look like Freddie Mercury normally, so there's a lot of work that goes on with the makeup, false teeth, which change the shape of my face and help me sing more like Freddie. It makes my open my mouth. Um, secondly, the voice, at least the, the live performance voice, which was slightly different to his recording voice, but um, you've got to have the power of the voice, and then thirdly, the as much as you can, the charisma and the um, the technique and the, the physical side of it. Obviously, um, he's got his, this huge vocal range, um, which took me a good sort of six to eight months to sort of get under my belt. Still learning now, still listening to a lot of Queen stuff, learning new tricks. There's the Freddie stance, which is, uh, I imagine, ballet-based at rest. The spin-out... And there's the spinning. <laughs> I mean, it's famous. Everyone knows the postures. And there's lots of little funny, um, funny um, runs. Yeah, there's lots to work with. He was very physical. And just lots of... And all this sort of thing. And all with attitude. 
But if you look at the live videos and the live performances where he's been on the road for 30 days, two hours a night, it's either gone or he's not trusting it. So he's singing the, 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 the low falsetto parts in hard voice and sometimes dropping off the notes altogether. Open up your mind and let me step inside. You see how it's breaking? It's a gentle note and it's breaking because of the wear and tear on my voice. Inside, it's gone. So to get around that, you sing it hard. Open up your mind and let me step inside. And that's what it would do live. It's a difference. Freddie's distinctive voice was in no small part due to his prominent front teeth, a trademark he chose never to change. The fact that Freddie had protruding teeth definitely contributed to um, his style of singing, his voice, his enunciation, his phrasing. Because I, I know for myself, I've had false teeth made, which are these, to help me look and feel more like Freddie. So as soon as I put these in, the shape of my face changes. And I immediately speak louder and open my mouth and have to sing past the teeth, as he did. And they happen to become Freddie. While he will always be best remembered as the lead singer with Queen, it is sometimes overlooked that Freddie was also an incredibly diverse and gifted songwriter. Uh, we actually forget that a great deal of work, a great deal of artistry, a great deal of talent went into those incredible songs. He tended to write on piano, but he could also write fully aware that he's got one of the greatest guitarists in the world uh, on stage with him. He could write for guitar, he could write harmony vocals, he could write strings, stuff that he didn't play but could sing for you and had in his head. He could also write extremely quickly. Uh, I mean, famously, he always claimed he wrote crazy little thing called love while taking a bath and drinking champagne. He always used to tell friends that Bohemian Rhapsody was written at the piano while he was getting a blowjob. Um, so suddenly, somebody to love, if you listen to that, there's a great deal of Aretha Franklin in there. People still think of it as a kind of a, in the same vein as Bohemian Rhapsody, but actually go back and listen to it, and you've got, um, you've got Memphis Soul going on right in the middle there. <laughs> that write very different songs and like um, I mean John's been writing quite a lot now and he just writes in that one area which he likes which is almost like a Tamla Motown or sort of and I love that because I love to sing on songs like that so he's very different so I mean he would never call his songs heavy or anything I think Queen just write four very different types of songs so like Brian writes from the guitar so we have that element and then Roger I think right from the drums, uh, he, he sort of crosses over a lot. So we have all kinds of things. Disco, you know, um, I mean, John Deacon famously swiped the riff for Another One Bites the Dust from Chic. But it was Freddie that really took on the whole 
disco aesthetic, uh, to the point where he actually looked like somebody out of the village people at one point. Um, and then they'd go and do it, you know, write the, the, the music to a soundtrack like Flash Gordon. Queen were always moving on from one album to another. Whenever a new album came out, it was always a surprise. Even in the 80s when they did Hot Space, which I think was Freddie's disco days in New York, I think they was rubbing off on him. It wasn't well received and it's hardly a classic, but um, it was different. He very, very consciously took Queen into that realm. Brian May wasn't comfortable uh, making music entirely that way. Roger Taylor was aghast. I mean, Roger, Roger's written a lot of different kind of things. Roger wrote Radio Gaga. Uh, Roger's no idiot by any means, but even he sensed that perhaps this was a bridge too far for Queen. I remember a crazy little thing called Love, he had a quiff, didn't he? By the time Another One Bites Dust, which was on the same album that was on the game, came out, you know, the cropped hair, you know, the, the tight white T-shirt, the, the straight jeans, the, the, you know, the, the big bushy cock dust and moustache. What is surprising is that it surprised perhaps a lot of other people. Certainly it was something that America found increasingly difficult to deal with. But when, I, when the sound was a bit more disco-orientated, it, it wasn't what people in America expected from a rock group. I mean, it didn't like completely disappear, but it made it, it they lost a lot of the original fan base who liked them for the more hard rock kind of sound. It was just for Brian and Roger, who were more dyed-in-the-wall rockers, America was a very important feather in the cap in terms of credibility, in terms of status. And when they lost it, um, they blamed Freddie. But it was always a case with America that Led Zeppelin were the British band they adored and they embraced and they loved. Queen were the British band who were big. And somehow the relationship between Queen and American audiences was never as deep and as abiding as between Queen, certainly, and their British fans. They never quite understood why Queen could be so diverse, why Freddie was a little bit camp, because they liked their rock gods with lots of testosterone. They didn't quite get the Freddie Mercury campiness. The very last time they toured there in 82, it was a calamity. Um, the albums weren't selling as well as they had been. Another uh, nail in the coffin was a video for I Want to Break Free, which was a pastiche of Coronation Street, but them dressed up in women's clothes. I mean, it's a hilarious video, and in Britain, we love that kind of thing. We think it's really, really funny. Nothing funnier than Le uh, Freddie in a leather miniskirt and a moustache. It's, it's hilarious, isn't it? It's so camp. It's really, really funny. Midwest America, though, different kind of place. I Want to Break Free was when they were, was when they were trying to come back, and Radio Gaga offered them the... looked like it was going to be a hit, and so that album, The Works... They didn't go back and tour, but they went back for a huge promotional thing. And it was during that that they released I Want to Break Free, which was a great catchy song. But then the video, just, it was over. At that point, literally, people in America threw in the towel. I said to Freddie, you know, the thing about that video that I like the most is when you're going from one room to the next, you go at double time. Your feet do little steps. He said, I said, I don't know how many people notice it, but I loved it. And he said, I'm so glad you noticed it. That's the thing about the video I'm proudest of. <laughs> he loved it. By the time of Live Aid, Queen were perceived to be a group that were, as it were, past its peak. Uh, in 83 and 84, they enjoyed a, a, another really good run of hit singles with Radio Gaga, I Want to Break Free. But the video age was upon us, and Queen were in that place where they were very much only as good as their last record. Uh, the idea that they were still a very vital live group had somewhat been overlooked. Certainly in America by then their career was over. Um, Live Aid 
absolutely transform that situation for them. It's, it's a pretty tedious day, really. I mean, it's, it's a good cause and all that, but it's not very exciting, is it? It's just kind of loads of bounds one after the other. And then Queen come on, and it's like, wow. Everyone was watching and forgotten how great they were live. It's just like, when they came on, the minute they come on, everyone's just thinking, oh, it's Queen, they'll just play some hits. And I think a lot of people in the mainstream, obviously Queen fans knew that the band was still good at what they were doing, but when they play that day, they win, they win it, don't they? The thing that Queen did at Live Aid that hardly any other artist did was understand quite what a big moment this was going to be and seize the opportunity. Queen were an extremely disciplined band, as they showed on the Live Aid concert. That 20 minutes they'd had on Live Aid, they rehearsed for two days. Status Quo, who famously started the day with rocking all over the world, um, told me afterwards they had no idea the impact that that one performance would have on their own career. Queen, because of Freddie, saw this for what it was, an unprecedented opportunity to go out and show who you are to the whole world before the internet, before multi-channel television, at an event that was literally going to be watched by pretty much anybody and everybody that had a TV set that day. Their masterstroke was that they anticipated what a moment it would be and absolutely seized the opportunity. And that was entirely down to Freddie. Afterwards, the only, people, the only thing people could talk about were Queen and how brilliant they'd been. So after this gap, and I wonder whether or not they'd run their course and it was really just winding downhill, Queen had a second, second go at it, really. Live Aid had an enormously revitalising effect on Queen's career. It worked for pretty much all the performers that played there that day, but Queen in particular. Uh, and they spent the next 12 months playing the biggest stadiums all over Europe and the rest of the world, to the point where by the summer of 86, exactly a year on, they're now back doing football stadiums in Britain. Everyone wanted to see Queen back on stage doing what they did best, doing those wonderful songs, performing Bohemian Rhapsody in the way that they did. Somehow, Queen locked back in to the national psyche. The buzz created by Live Aid had reignited Queen's career. The 1986 album A Kind of Magic was hugely successful, and the magic tour of that year, seen by over a million people, would prove to be the biggest ever Queen show. As fate would have it, however, these would also be the last shows that the four members of Queen would play together. But Freddie was already aware that he was ill. Uh, the rest of the group weren't. But uh, it wasn't long after that that Freddie realised it was time to discuss it with the group. In the mid-80s, during breaks from Queen, Freddie had begun to try out various solo projects, beginning with the release of his 1985 album, Mr Bad Guy. Of course people ask the same questions, because some, some of the questions are current and they want to know about uh, the same things. So ask me about my solo album then, huh? <laughs> yeah, what about your solo album? Oh, it's great. Of course it is. <laughs> Freddie was never shy at saying what he wanted to do, but um, I think obviously working on his own without the rest of the boys in Queen, he had 100% total control. So obviously there was no one pulling him back or sending him in, in other directions. He got the full artistic control of what he did. There were some fantastic tracks on there. Uh, Living on my own, I was born to love you, made in heaven. It's fairly obvious here who's a person who's been hanging out in the clubs has got to the disco thing because he does it with Giorgio Moroder. Moroder's like a, he's like an amazing like producer. I mean, he did that stuff in the seventies with Donna Summer. Freddie Mercury did another solo thing when he got hold of the Platters song The Great Pretender and covered it superbly and had a big hit. I think it reached number four in the UK, and it really represented him. Like Freddie said himself, he was the great pretender. You know, he had this flamboyant lifestyle, um, you know, of touring, uh, performing on stage. Um, but behind closed doors, he was quite a, a shy, 
quiet man who just wanted to put his feet up and maybe have a cup of tea and a slice of cake sort of thing. You go through all the different characters and then you're pretending anyway. So I think it's a great title for, for, for what I do and it sort of suited uh, to what I was doing. I mean, although the meaning, the meaning in the song of how it was, is all to do with love, that he's pretending about love, but I mean, I, I sort of take it a stage further, I think, you know, the way I see it is that I'm pretending, you know, that all this is a pretense, you know, and it's, it's, it's just fun. I had to sort of um, choose um, key roles that I did in, in the past and then to try and marry them with, with the word pretender and things like that. So basically we just had um, different mini sets built all the way around the studios and I just sort of recreated some of the things in my costumes and then we just sort of bridged the two together with lighting sort of technique and things. Hello, my name is Freddie Mercury, and this is my latest recording, The Great Pretender. But no one can tell. Oh, yes, I'm the great pretender. With Great Pretender, it shows that Freddie Mercury always had a sense of humour as well. And there is a sense of humour in Queen. I mean, yes, there's a serious about it, but there's, there's also, there is something funny. It's a tongue and cheapness. There's always campness. I mean, camp is, 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 is a sense of humour to be camp in the first place. To have a campness is, is funny. I don't think that the Queen solo projects were their best work, even though Freddie's solo album was good. Paul, he invited me over to his home and he played me the record and he was sitting there all the way through wanting to see what I thought of it. And I said at the end, I think there were four hit singles on here. And ultimately there were four hit singles, but of course he was not really going to know that because they didn't all succeed before his death. Her name is Montserrat Caballé and she comes from Barcelona. And she just called up um, a few weeks ago and said she'd like to um, sing with me. So, of course, I fell flat on the floor, you know, I thought, my God. But I've loved her, you know, for years. And I think it worked when I went to um, Barcelona um, recently. So I, I did a, a TV show, and they asked me, you know, and I said, well, you know, she's the best singer in the world, and, I'd, you know, I'd love to be able to sing with her. So she, she must have read, well, she must have seen it. And so she called up the office and said she'd like to do things. So... Um, well, last night, I mean, she sang one of my songs at, at the Royal Opera House, so it's amazing. I mean, now I'm going into opera, you know, forget rock and roll. Is this a new experience, an exciting experience? Absolutely, it's such a challenge, actually. It's, um... And you also worked lyrically with someone like Tim Rice on Fallen Priest and Golden Boy on the album. He wrote some of the lyrics. And the overall feel of the album was much more of a serious work this wasn't a pop album or a rock album or even an album by a pop artist. This was an album from uh, two artists from different worlds coming together to create a serious piece of art, serious piece of work. And in its own right, it's a very good album. Like all the great Freddie moments, teetered on the edge of overindulgent self-parody. In fact, I'm sure there are people that will say that's exactly what it was. But that isn't why hundreds of thousands of people bought those records. That isn't what made it a huge hit. What made it a huge hit was just a tremendously uh, catchy song which people wanted to have in their lives.
can you say? Absolutely fantastic. Um, his vocal range, you know, going back to his singing, and his writing um, capabilities, it just went to another level. Um, and I'm sure um, if he hadn't passed away in 91, I'm sure he would have been sort of performing at the Covent Garden now. Despite his songwriting creativity continuing to flourish and the enduring popularity of Queen, Freddie was sadly coming to the final stages of a glorious music career. He had contracted the HIV virus some years earlier, and by the late 80s was starting to show signs of illness. We knew that Freddie was lost, and I had known it in my bones since 1983. When, at the nightclub called Heaven, in a room called the Star Bar, I said to Freddie, has your attitude and behavior changed in light of this new disease in America? And he said, darling, my attitude is, fuck it. I'm doing everything with everybody. And I had that sinking feeling. There really is a sinking feeling. And I just thought, my friend is going to die. Once Freddie uh, became so ill he could no longer hide it from the rest of the band, the main question was, what strategy do we develop to deal with this? Um, there were other people in the group who would have been uh, very accepting of the fact, and if Freddie had wanted to call it a day there and then, and just enjoy his last few years in as much privacy and quiet as he could get, they would have absolutely understood and have been uh, at peace with that. But being Freddie, of course, uh, he chose the other option. Um, and if you think about it, perhaps it's, it's easier to understand why. I mean, when your whole life, your whole identity as a person is built around the fact that you are this incredibly charismatic and unique stage performer to be told that actually you can't go on a stage anymore is maybe worse than death itself maybe a kind of a living death a small death but while we're here i'm not freddie who's ill i'm freddie mercury lead singer of queen and we're going to make a great queen album freddie's lack of acknowledgement of, of his illness at the time i'm sure that um people who work with HIV and, and, and the charities that, that, that you know, help battle against it um, probably found out frustrating um, that he didn't basically come forward and tell people what they already knew or confirm what people were assuming. Um, but what you have to bear in mind is that, I mean, he, at that time, Fred was, Freddie was dealing with something that basically meant the end of his life. According to Brian May... That was when Freddie was his happiest in the last few years. Because in the studio, there was no time to talk about all the other stuff, no time to feel sorry for him. He wouldn't tolerate that kind of behaviour towards him. Uh, it was, let's get on. I mean, he worked right up to the very end, you know, literally the very end. Um, there was times where he could only sort of sing, sing a line at a time in the, in the, in the studio. And... Um, it was very special, you know, obviously for the band because they wanted to put another album together and obviously their good friend, uh, you know, part of the family really, um, they wanted to spend as much time as they could with it. I think he proved that uh, there wasn't a sympathy vote. It was literally, is this stuff any good? Do I want to buy it? Do I want to hear it? Do I want to play it? And the answer, you know, um, spectacularly was yes. Queen um, worked really hard. Um, 
I think it's the, the only band in history um, which each member's wrote a number one or had a, a you know a, a single in the charts over the career. By the time you get to the last few years when Freddie's ill, these things are now put into perspective. These things are no longer an issue. It's all about making the most of what time they had left, not knowing how much time they had left, whether this would be the last thing they'd ever do. On November 23rd, 1991, after months of intense speculation about his health, Freddie requested a statement to be made to the press, confirming that he was suffering from AIDS. Just over 24 hours later, at the age of 45, Freddie Mercury died at his Kensington home, bringing to an end one of the great musical careers. His death actually brought a lot of people together and made people wonder more about what this disease was. And obviously the, the remaining members of Queen, because of their personal investment in it, played a crucial part and role in the whole thing in trying to promote understanding. With his incredibly powerful singing voice, charisma and deep bond with fans, together with his remarkable talent as a songwriter and inimitable style, it is hard to imagine there ever being another Freddie Mercury. A one-off entertainer, he has left behind an unrivaled body of work that continues to delight and inspire audiences, old and new. The big difference with Freddie to any other rock, rock star are the different facets. He'd got so many sides. He'd got the voice. He'd got the rock star, big, strong voice. He'd got a big image, bigger than any other rock star. He was a fantastic pianist and musician which not all rock stars are. So there's so many sides to Freddie Mercury, and of course the songwriting. He wrote some of the greatest songs ever written in popular music. So that's why Freddie was as good as Freddie was. And even though he's the most unlikely looking pop star, rock star, he, you know, he's got this guy's short hair and a moustache wearing a yellow top. It's, on paper that shouldn't really work, but he's got a complete innate charisma. This guy is utterly charismatic, you know. In a, in, in a way, you shouldn't be at all, but charisma's not what you look like, it's just what you are like. As a front man, Freddie Mercury wasn't really your archetypal, you know, wasted, waif, pretty boy singer. Uh, he may have been a bit more like that in the early 70s when Queen first began, but by the time, you know, you get to the 80s, particularly after Live Aid, when the group are at this sudden, brand new plateau in terms of famous stardom, a guy like that shouldn't be prancing around the stage as though he was 18 years old and a, a, a ballet dancer. Um, but Freddie did. You know, Freddie didn't give a shit. You always got the impression that he wasn't taking himself seriously. Going back to what I was saying about, you know, uh, rather pompous uh, strutting bands. You can get the feeling of that with uh, Freddie Mercury. He, he knew what it was about. It's about entertainment in the end. I think the thing um, with Freddie, whenever he performed live, um, whether it was in front of, uh, you know, 100 people, if it was in front of 225,000 know, people, um, for everybody who was in the audience, he made that, that one person, you know, feel special for, for two hours. Uh, one of the things you notice when you watch any, any uh, live performance with Freddie Mercury is uh, he uses every inch of stage. And he, there's no part of the stadium, uh, no matter how huge it is, doesn't feel involved. And that's what it makes him likeable. That's why uh, Mick Jagger as well, you know, you, you feel that, uh, you know, they care about what you think about them and uh, whether you're enjoying yourself. And Freddie Mercury did that in spades. Freddie Mercury was probably the most willing superstar that had ever been. He changed his name to Mercury. What are you going to do with a name like Mercury? Be a superstar. He wore yellow jackets, he wore spandex. Everything to excess. He was, he was convinced he was going to be the best, and he was. He was a peacock, you know, once he was on stage, that was it. It was, right, I'm here for two hours, you're going to watch me. Um, everything I say or do, you're going to sort of listen, and you're going to take note, and you're going to get involved, and uh, when I want you to sing, you're going to sing. Perhaps there's just a bit of Freddie Mercury in us all, and I'm sure Freddie would have liked to have put a little bit more in some of us as well, but it, it, there's something about Freddie Mercury which spoke to us, which is, no, I'm not perfect and neither are you. Uh, yes, I think a lot of myself and so do you, but aren't these songs marvellous? Don't you enjoy singing them with me? And aren't we having a grand time today? 
and how little do we care what anybody else thinks. Thank you.